there's so many aspects and so many people it's, whose lives it's completely transformed, you know. And it's funny because it's, it's the last thing we're allowed to talk about. Hi babes, Lady Silverstone here and welcome to my podcast where we're trying to demystify cannabis one conversation at a time. In this episode I'm talking to Zinmar, a cool cannabis activist living the city life in London with her husband and two kids. We're talking about stigma, periods, the importance of clinical trials, beauty advertisement and female leaders in the cannabis space. I hope you'll enjoy it. I'm so excited to talk to you. How are you doing? Hi, thank you. It's so funny because we've been doing the lockdown for about, I don't know, it feels like about three weeks, three or four weeks now. Yeah. I've got two kids, um, two little boys. Uh, yeah. One of them is 11, uh, he's, he's Max, and I've got Charlie who's eight. So we just had to get used to just the homeschooling. A lot of people sort of talk about what they're grateful for, and I would say I'm definitely grateful for teachers and oh. their sort of scramble to have to completely change the curriculum. And it's not major stuff, you know, we're quite lucky, but it's still things that you still want them to, to do, like the English and the maths, and yeah. you know, things like French and geography. We did a little bit of geography the other day. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit <laughs> so high on the list at the moment but yeah we're just trying to get through but yeah everything's been fine here in, and how is it for you how's it for you it's it's good i mean it's fine it's i th- i don't know when uk went to lockdown but i think it was like one and a half week or two weeks after Spain, or something like that, right? Yeah. So, yeah, we're in on our fifth week. I think we started our sixth week, like, yesterday, like, starting in the sixth week. I mean, it's... And when, when, you, when, when your lockdown is locked down, what, what does that mean? Does it mean that... I and mean, when you went out, I, I texted you earlier, and you were talk, saying that you're out for a walk with your little dog. Yeah. You know, is that... Is that kind of okay? Is it better to do it in the morning? Or is it, you know... Because here, I think dogs yeah. are have to go out but I've heard that some countries just don't let anybody out and yeah you know here they've started to actually cordon off things like the children's playgrounds and things like that so yes. you know I mean is that what it's like yeah yeah there? yeah so here so it was like three weeks ago or something I went with a walk with my dog and I went five minutes away from my house and I got stopped by the police and he wanted to give me a fine because I walked too far from home really yeah but again, we're not as bad as in France, because in France, you will have to write that you're letting yourself go out. So you're saying that, okay, so here, myself, letting myself go to buy groceries at this I'll place. I'll sign you know? it by myself. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's so fun. Yeah. So that, that I'm so happy that we don't have, because that would just be, I don't know, I think it's a bit far. But you're from, you're originally from yeah. Sweden, right? Yes. So you, your approach has been so different um, yes. and so, so bold, actually. I know that Sweden is a much smaller country, but, you know, my husband and I, we talk about it every day. And he's like, you know, Sweden have really got the, the best idea when in, terms of, in terms of balance. You know, I think mm. it's been really difficult for every country because, okay, I'm from, originally, I'm from Myanmar. And yeah. Myanmar is next to Thailand. And... The original word from Myanmar was, oh, you know, everyone's immunity is really strong in Myanmar because we've got, you know, everyone eats on the street. We've got street food vendors everywhere and people don't even social distance. They're very on top of each other. If you go to, if you go in an elevator in Myanmar, people are like that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I lived in really Asia not- for three years. Like, it's really, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So really oh yeah exactly right so you personal space is yeah. different it's oh it different doesn't exist area. yeah <laughs> it doesn't exist no. so yeah, like, we haven't had any any uh you know any reported cases there's no active infections and it's probably also because they weren't testing so much but i think mm. there's been a real difference in obviously developing countries and and hot countries as well yeah. versus cool countries um but yeah it's been it's been really bizarre but Sweden seem to have an approach which obviously balances out the economy and the effect it's going to have on the economy as well that that is true yeah definitely definitely and I think you know it's it's hard to know yeah where to go you know who knows maybe Sweden is the one that is doing the right thing 
Yeah. Maybe they're exactly. the ones that are going to come out with an okay economy, yet with yeah. not too many deaths or too many cases, and maybe they managed to reach this perfect her, uh, herb. No, not herb. You <laughs> immune herb. <laughs> <laughs> like a Freudian flip. <laughs> herd <laughs> immunity. Uh, uh, yeah, herb, herb immunity. <laughs> Yeah. But, you know, speaking about herbs, um, yes. yeah, you are in Spain, right? So, yeah. and, 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 you know, what's been really interesting, you know, obviously we both, with this is our favourite subject, is, you know, cannabis and CBD and everything, and just sort of, yes. I think what's been really interesting to me about the plant and, you know, uh, this is what's going on around us is just obviously the whole self-care at home. Mm. And, you know, I think from a personal perspective, I'm a mum, I'm a busy mum, you know, when I... When I came back to England, I started looking at all of this space and I started working, you know, with, with med legal medical cannabis and CBD. And I really thought that Britain was going to be a bit more open to the whole subject. Yeah. And I was really surprised when I got back. At back how, from where, actually? From, okay, so I bet, so just to give you a really quick, you know, yeah. I, I was born in, um, I was born in Myanmar, in Yangon, and I came here when I was about two years old. My dad, he's a psychiatrist. So we came as a family when I was really little and we lived on, on, in the grounds of, of the hospital, which is where all the doctors from abroad lived. And I know it's really bizarre, so back then, the hospital was called an asylum. So you have the hospital here, and you know, this is the thing, so I think I've always been really interested in mental health because my dad's a psychiatrist, but yeah. back then, I just remember coming to this giant Victorian building, and it was called, I think it was called the Hanwell Institute for the Lunatics or something. No really way. Oh, yeah, wait. and that was in 1977. So okay. I think it's now called the West London uh, Mental Health Unit, whatever, it's, it's a leading, now it's like a leading kind of like a, place that people go for mental health but back then even in England it was asylums homes for lunatics and that was the kind of language wow. that we even used here and so you know I think my dad when when we arrived my dad's very deeply Buddhist my parents are very Buddhist so he kind of came and he brought he worked for the NHS for about 45 years oh, and wow. he brought yeah and he brought a real Mr Miyagi kind of vibe <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably the best thing I can describe. My dad's like a Mr. Miyagi. Imagine like Mr. Miyagi. He's quite small and he's very chilled. And, yeah. Um, so he would be very kind of, he'd bring a very calming, soothing sort of effect on, you know, to his patients and things. So I kind of used to, grow, I grew up a little bit on that particular ground and then we moved away. But I just remember sort of under, having a very early understanding of, you know, um, how people were treated differently, you know, for yeah. different things and, and how illness was perceived and, and viewed and how my dad used to say to me, no, you know, like, this is how it is. It's just a lack of understanding, a lack of education. Mm. And so, you know, I think early on, I really understood that so many things can be misstrued uh, yeah. and misconceived. And then, yeah, so we went, you know, I, I grew up here and I started in advertising when I was, come straight out of university and I suppose I've been in advertising pretty much yeah my whole life marketing advertising I loved the idea of you know films and I, I thought it seemed really glamorous before I get, went yeah. into it agencies, agencies are really glamorous but it's kind of a, a real work hard play hard and it is yeah but you know I think even at the time then it was I really sort of understood that messaging and media is is very formed by a very small group of people, you know? I mean, yeah. if you look at sort of like, because I've worked a lot on, on shampoo and a lot of skincare as well, you know, the idea of feminine beauty and beauty um, back then, I think it's evolved a lot now, but it's just been really interesting to see how that's evolved and how brands, so I've always been really interested in brands and branding. And then I had two kids and I met my husband and then priorities change, right? So I mean, yeah, like, all of course. Of priorities change. Yeah, and I think I was a lot more aware of, of consumerism, you know, especially after working for these big brands. You know, you're, you're very aware of how these messages are made and how we influence. And 
you know, I just remember, and I, you know, I've always been interested in sort of like conscious consumerism, right? But when I first had my first baby, I remember getting a packet of Johnson & Johnson. Um, it's like a baby care thing. And they've got like your wet wipes and your you know, powder. And it's got like tons of products in there and you get it free. And what I didn't realize is you know, really how some of these, these ingredients are really toxic. And so I think from then on, I started to really move towards a bit more of a natural yeah, way. Especially of when you see it with your baby, like you don't want to put these on your baby. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. But the thing is, to be honest, I didn't really know back then. I really no. didn't know. I was kind of like, you know, I, 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 I thought Johnson Johnson baby oil was amazing. <laughs> yeah, like why would they give you toxic stuff for free? You know, to take care of your babies, right? Exactly. And yeah. but saying it now, you do think to yourself, God, of course, yeah, duh. Yeah. But you know, I think the whole world was really much. I mean, wet wipes. You know, why did we even need wet wipes in the first place? So I mean. Yeah, I think so. Art, you know, working for big brands and sort of really understanding sort of how a lot of it, a lot of this messaging, a lot of these these facts are shielded from consumers. I kind of went out on a mission to really understand it more. You know, I think I, I felt that I was in a position to really get brands and understand their marketing. So I feel very protective over consumers and over mums and and especially how much we spend on all these products. So yeah, I, you know, I've always been interested in that. But yeah. Going back to what, what, where, why I was came into this this whole industry, um, I got to the stage where I'd had my two kids and I was doing, you know, freelance um, brand building and marketing, but there was a big side of me that really kind of wanted to, to to learn more, and I just wanted a bit more out of life, and that was when I got felt this real pull to go back home to Myanmar, and my husband lived in. Hong Kong for a really long time so okay. he was yeah he was really great you know with Asia that's kind of how why I married him also because I, yeah. really <laughs> yeah. I knew I knew I wanted to live back in Asia for a little bit one day and so we took our kids and I went and I worked for a really big finance company now again never thought I'd work with finance it was yeah. a really big private bank um, but it was for a big family uh, they had a massive private bank out there which was the biggest one and their mission was like a hundred percent financial literacy in a country which only used cash so it was like a really big challenge yeah um and it was a really interesting position like a really interesting role so you know again it was like fate i felt like i really really was meant to do that role and over a period of four years I helped this brand build out their communications. Um, it was like a little mini agency that was pretty much running by the end of it. And we had corporate communications and PR and we had investor relations and stuff. It was really fun. And then I think that made me realize how important education was. You know, I'd come mm. from England and, and I'd grown up in England and you take for granted what the government do for you, actually. Yeah. You know, even things like public service announcements, right? I mean, you know, where you are, where we all are right now, we've all yeah. got public service announcements coming at us in the newspaper. It might be about washing your hands or whatever. But if you don't have that and your country doesn't have that, you're yeah. literally left with a whole country full of people who haven't got a clue what to do. So I think I've got a real appreciation of democracy and what it takes to kind yeah. of like a country sort of moving. And then after about four years, everything was fine. And then my husband contracted a bit of skin cancer on his face. And we were, you know, out. We used to play tennis a hell of a lot. Right? And it was just one of those little things. It was like a, a little cut on the, his forehead. Yeah. And it just stayed there for a really long time. It wasn't a very serious form of cancer. But I just remember at the time I'm thinking, God, I wish I had a bit of... Um, cannabis oil to, to see if I could put on it and my yeah. friend had, to, had told me about cannabis oil for about seven years ago and he told me that he used cannabis oil on his mum's really paper thin skin mm -hmm. and you know how you get like people have paper thin skin and it doesn't really heal that very well yeah so he and you get cut and you bleed a lot exactly yeah. and it's kind of i think as you grow older right it's really yeah difficult. yeah you see old people with the sort of little blood kind of clot so he was using that for his mom's sort of skin lesions and i just remember thinking oh you know it'd be really good if james had that on his skin but now i i i love cannabis i've always used it kind of like rec recreationally just sort of casually just you know on the weekends probably on the evenings as well but yeah. it's never really been a big deal to me but the idea of the oil having such a medicinal effect uh, you know i really started thinking about it and it was 
that moment on, while I was in Burma, that I just literally sat on my sort of, we've got this terrace, and I just, through my phone, <laughs> which is amazing, just started learning about the whole world, and not, I just got completely pulled in, and yeah, I didn't yeah. realise that it was the big thing, it was like an industry that was happening abroad, with all these amazing people, including yourself, and I think I started looking at, because I love social media, I work with social media, I started looking at people like um, April Pride from uh, Vanderpop, I started looking at, I am cannabis, I'm cannabis, you know, yeah. best buyers. Yeah. And again, I just sat there thinking, oh my God, and I was, I was sitting in a country where it's really regulated. It was in Myanmar. I was in Myanmar at the time. If you are caught with anything in Myanmar, it's five years to, it's, it's a lot, right? And yeah. I, I come back from a meeting one, one day and, and one of the guys in my team, he was, he was a videographer, had come, turned up late for a meeting. And I remember being really annoyed because it was a really important meeting. Yeah. And we were like, I the client. And afterwards I said to him, what happened? You know, how come you're late? And he said to me, oh, you know, my friend just got done for like this amount of weed oh. and we're, we're not even talking about good weed yet we're just talking about i know you know what? Gets, i really like to yeah like with it. branches and seed and very dry yeah not really gonna get you that high it's kind of no. keep you bubbling over a bit but you know it's so not really strong stuff um, and his friend you know he was 21 years old and you know they'd spent the night really kind of like being harassed and intimidated by the police and i just thought wow that's just so unfair and it, w yeah. it really struck me that i was looking at a world through my phone where everyone could smoke and everyone was doing these like smoking videos and doing everything right yeah. and it was just amazing and yet in front of me there was a situation which was completely different and so the idea of the injustice around that and just yeah. sort of thinking, wow, this is so wrong. And also seeing people like Chelsea Leyland through my phone yeah. <laughs> and like Carly Barton through my phone and understanding that people were really fighting this, this cause. It just made me really kind of like angry and inspired and kind of really driven at the same time. And then I had my husband who's trying to deal with his kind of little bit of skin cancer. And I just thought, why don't we have this? Yeah. Why isn't everyone allowed? to have this kind of um, access. And I think that's just when I started really, really getting into it. And then I thought, well, what can I do? What can, it obviously, we need people in the industry, you know, and I was amazed at the women and the leadership from the women. Oh, and so the, strong, yes. It's so strong. And, yeah. and just sort of understanding, wow, it's just sort of like all these different females are leading and yeah. I'm working in finance, which is quite difficult. I had a few sort of, um, personal sort of you know gender kind of like things that I was working through because it was a very male dominant native uh, country and I just thought wow this is an industry that that really could make a huge impact and then when I understood the benefits of hemp sort of so going from understanding a little bit more about recreational cannabis to industrial hemp and just the scope of what the plant can do Hempcrete, amazing! I know, <laughs> I know. Ugh. Amazing! And I just thought, wow, we're sitting on the very tippy top of this huge iceberg of knowledge that yeah. no one's really. And it's a bit like this. Like, you know, has anyone else <laughs> noticed? Yes. So, you know, and I, and I, when I asked my friends at home, you know, all my London friends, no, they hadn't heard of CBD and they hadn't been using CBD. And it was bizarre. So I just really, I just flew straight into it. And I just thought, right, I am going to use my skills, whatever I can do, and I'm going to help join this fight. You know, oh, Mother Nature. You're <laughs> awesome. That Mother Nature is going to be my client. And I yes. need another client. I was like, you need no you other client. We don't need any other client. Uh -huh. And I think I thought, okay, well, I've been working for brands who, you know, as well as giving us fantastic, you know, fantastic kind of hygiene products we we hadn't really been looking at closely and you know they got they some of these brands get so big that a lot yeah. of the things that i believed in got pushed aside so you know the whole idea of kind of move the movement towards something that's different and something that is about the people planet prosperity is where i want to be so i think you know that's and then from there I thought, okay, well, I really want there to be a UK voice. And this mm. is why I started writing and just expressing like you, you do as well. You know, I think mm. it's, it just felt like 
an expression. I just wanted to express, and that's yeah. probably the reason. And I wanted to, to learn more, and I wanted to also help teach myself and teach my friends. And when we got back, so I spent four years in Myanmar. My, so my when did you was, get back, actually? So we got back about uh, a year and a half, just only oh, a year Oh, okay, it's so very recent back, then. Quite recent, yeah. So I started, I started researching everything when I was out in Myanmar. And researching a plant that's very illegal in a country that's very illegal, <laughs> and then researching about it in, yes. in a country that's very it's really frustrating. So oh, I yes, I can imagine. <laughs> You're so lucky, right? You're so lucky to be in Spain. Where it's oh, I am. I am, yeah. And so I got back and then um, I think I just sort of really, the first thing that I did was the day after I landed, I went to an entourage event. Entourage Network is a London sort of like female cannabis network. I couldn't even believe it existed, to be honest, because I was looking for everything. And there wasn't a huge amount of, of people who were really kind of, there were some people, but it was more top level, you know, um, yeah. very investor kind of stuff and big, huge, big companies. But yeah, it was really nice. You know, when I first went to this, my first sort of cannabis, you know, event was, I remember it was in Shoreditch and I walked in and I didn't really know what to expect. Um, you know, would it be just like full of people smoking, you know, but it, yeah. it wasn't. It was just, it's hard to imagine, like from the yeah, first exactly. time. Yeah, like, That's the first female kind of, and it was their second, it was, it was very new, so it was their second event. And I got to this beautiful sort of warehouse, it had those like palm trees, and I think there was this neon sign that said, loose lips sink ships. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do, right? So that, that was quite nice. And I just remember thinking, this is like a really lovely, safe environment. And I think yeah. that, was, that was the whole point of that event. It was yeah. to create a safe environment that people, women, could really come and talk. So to what do they do at that event? Like, is there a few people talking? Like, is there a lot of mingle? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Yeah. So that that particular event, it, we had. I mean, it was really nice. It was. It we had Callie uh, Blackbar, who's an activist, and I've seen her on TV. Callie has this like bright pink hair. You cannot miss her. Yeah. Yeah. Really, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I know. Was, yes. You know. Yeah. It's like whatever you. Say, and she's got this. She, now, Callie wrote this amazing book called Boy in. I think it was like Boy in Seven Billion, and it was about her son. So Callie's been, been, been really fighting for a long time. You know, Daryl was only, I think he was really young, about seven or eight, about the same age as Charlie. Oh. She, she treated him with cannabis oil, but you know, at the time, obviously, it wasn't legal. And, you know, THC levels are not legal here. And, mm. you know, she told, in that room, she told her story. It was a patient story about a mother trying to save her kid's life. And it was just, I just remember sitting there thinking, wow, this is, you know, why is it that we don't have access? Why is it that that lady, that lovely lady sitting up there mm. is seen as a criminal? This is yeah. crazy, you know, absolutely crazy. And, you know, uh, her son actually recovered really, really well. He's healthy. He's out dating now. He plays sports. He's, you know, I think he's a teenager. He's a lovely looking guy. He's really lovely. And so just the idea of, you know, this mother saving her son, going against all odds. Yeah. And, you know, her friends. Imagine people, everyone sort of saying, no, 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 it's not the right thing to do. And yet she did it. She saved his life. And, you know, ultimately, I think it was people like her and, you know, from hearing these stories, I mean, there, Kelly was there. And then there was another lady from Humboldt Seed Organization. So... Humboldt seeds came and they were talking about seed genetics. <laughs> Again, I just sat there thinking, this is just amazing. You know, we're, we're talking about patient stories in, in one minute and then we're talking about seed genetics. You know, what this plant has so many aspects and the panel was fantastic. It was, you know, chaired by Jasmine and Jess who run the Entourage Network. And then for lunch, we had lovely light vegan lunch um, from organic, I think I can never pronounce it, Organic patisserie. It's a, it's a vegan sort of like French patisserie. Uh, it's organic liberty. I think it's. I'm, I'm going to send it to oh, you. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it, we had that, and again, amazing. And I met loads of really wonderful women. And you know, that is something that has to happen everywhere, all around the oh, world. You know, yes, yes, yes. 
small events, you know, not necessarily big ones. I think that that event that I went to, there was probably about 20, 30 women. And I think that's that was, perfect. Otherwise it gets, you know, there's different events for different kind of sizes. And that, and I think from there, I just, that was it. the things that I'm passionate about and the things that I, I fight for and I, you know, I really believe in are conscious consumerism. You know, the fact that women all around the world, we spend a lot on a lot, and yet, you know, do we really know what the value of that product really is? If we pay two pounds seventy six for, I don't know, a shower gel or whatever, how much is that actually costing the earth? And you know, there's there's this theory which is sort of like green, green value, and green investment, and really understanding what the real cost to the yeah. planet and to people are, right? So I try and teach that to my sons. Like today, we were talking sweatshops in, in uh, you know Vietnam and, and in all these different Asian countries and kind of like trying to get my kids to understand the sort of the cycle you know with the production of you know just things like trainers so yeah I'm really passionate about that because I've got two Gen Z boys and then I'm also really passionate about sustainability and how we can use the plant um, mm. to really create a more resilient and sustainable future yeah yeah and I wanted to ask you because I want to switch now because I've been talking for a <laughs> No, but it's so good. Thank you <laughs> for sharing everything. You, yeah, I wanted to ask you, you know, how you started because it's so interesting to hear people's stories because everyone's in a different country in the world as well. Yeah. And each country has different parameters. I'm in the UK. God knows when we're going to, you know, get real about cannabis in terms oh, of free yeah. under- You know, I think, I, I think now... I'm really hoping that because we've had um, this period, we are going to have to look at the economy. We are going to be forced to look at tax revenue. Yeah. And pound for pound, mm. you know, medical cannabis and CBD, you know, the actual sort of and demand, it is something that can really help a country, not just with the wellness, but also with the economy as well. Oh, so, yes. yeah, right? so, I mean, what's it like? Yeah, I'd love to know, what's it, what is it like to be where you are <laughs> yeah. what's your typical trip to wherever you know do, do you go to like a shop you know how do you go do you go to a dispensary how yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I know. so I mean here it's it's really nice so we're a bit like Holland if you've been to a coffee shop in Holland yeah 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 I've been to yeah like times. it's very open you can see it everywhere yeah. you can see you can walk in you see everything from the outside the difference here is that you cannot see it from the outside. And what is actually really interesting, and because I was looking, how come we can still get caught if we smoke outside? But, you yeah. know, it's kind of tolerated. You smell everywhere, people sitting on the beach, walking the dog, or, you know, you can smell it <laughs> everywhere. So it's... You're like, eh? Hey? Yeah. Ah, <laughs> yes. You get a good eye contact. I can smell that haze. <laughs> smell good. Yes. <laughs> So, I mean, and it's the same in France where I lived before uh, as well. It's the same. It's quite tolerated in the society. Then, yes, the loss is there and you can get in trouble for sure. But so what is like in Spain, they have that personal use is decriminalized, basically. Yeah. Which means that you can grow. I think it's up to like two or three plants per person, uh, which is really good. And also, if you would get caught, as long as they don't find any small, like, plastic bags and stuff like that, yeah, it's fine. Uh, so what happened is that they managed to, like, okay, so we are allowed to do it by ourselves, smoke by ourselves, grow by ourselves. Then how about if we create this association where, I, let's say that 10 people pay me a monthly fee for me to grow their plants. Oh, uh, okay. So yeah. Kind of like, right, so... Is it for, I mean, do you have to have, is it like in America where you've got the patient at the end of that or do you, or can it be for anybody kind of thing? can be for anybody, yeah. So what you do here is that you go to one of these like cannabis social clubs. I love the name. Cannabis social club sounds so social nice. Club. Sounds better than coffee sounds shops, better. no? Yeah, it's yeah. Like one of the social clubs. <laughs> <laughs> for cannabis. <Yeah. laughs> love it. <laughs> so what we do is that we pay 10 euros and then we have a three month, membership so basically let's say that they have 100 members that pay 10 euros for three months and then they will grow our plants basically so that's the whole concept of like the cannabis social clubs here in spain 
<laughs> okay, so I, just to make sure I've got this right. So I joined the Sat Canvas Social Club and this is where I get my weed. Yeah. I can yeah. Grow, and, and that's where, so say somebody's going to grow me my whole supply for this year. And I just get it from that, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. So they will grow. So they will have it. It's, it's awesome. I love Amazing. it. Amazing. Yeah. And also, you know, that was kind of like, because the, the one thing that I do think, you know, with the, these massive dispensaries in, in America, it's like, God, it's just, there are so many products. <laughs> it's just like, I know, a I know. sea of products. And like, I, I do wonder, one, you know, in the ideal world, do we really need so much? You know, I always yeah. think to myself, I like to keep my life quite sort of, I like choice. But I don't like bad choice, right? You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want you want some sort of level of curation. I don't want to be just Definitely. throwing like tons of everything. No. So that, yeah. That route sounds really nice. You know. It you is really that. nice. And it's a very easy, so, you know, you go there and so what you have to do is that you have to stay at least 30 minutes in the, the, club. <laughs> the in the club, exactly. Right. Which is really nice. Right. You know, we there's a lot of like nice stuff. No, exactly. You cannot pick up yeah. a lead, like, because they yeah. don't want people no. running yeah. in and out, basically. Yeah. There's no social side to that. Exactly. Yeah. So you have to sit down Stop and socialize. Yeah. you got to sit and relax. <laughs> yeah. Which is really nice, actually. I think it's a really nice... Um, concept and then they have you know yeah. okay so the one that i usually go to has i don't know maybe 10 different choices some of them they're like yeah this is grown from like california seeds and this is out outdoor seeds and this is indoor grown uh, yeah whatever yeah, it might yeah. be so it's really nice that they have not too many choices but yet yeah. way more than if you get it from the street obviously yeah you know yeah, yeah. which is super nice and mm. yeah i would say that like the the price is between yeah, like four to nine euros per gram, which is... That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah it's pretty good. You yeah. Know? And you know what you're getting. I mean, exactly, you know, yeah, more or less. Thing. Yeah. I mean, look, while we're on the subject of sort of like illegal, legal, you know, okay, that's, that experience sounds so nice. It sounds so safe, it, inviting, it sounds welcome. Mm-hmm. You know, when you think about, and, and inclusive, because this is the thing, you know, even the event, the cannabis event, inclusive. What you're experiencing that you've just, you know, described to me, that's inclusive. A woman can go there and feel, you know, that let's say here, if you do want to consume, yes, you can get these menus and stuff like that. But, you know, a lot of it is all still, you go and see somebody and then you come back and, you know, it all carries risk. And it's so unfair. And it's just wrong. Yeah. You know? It's just Definitely, no, and, and women and females don't get to do. A, you don't really get to. I think get to consume, but it's just it's just not the, ch- the control and the choice isn't as much in no. your hands. You know? No, because I think if you're in a partnership, like my husband will always, you know, people will always say, "Oh no, 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 you stay at home. So I, I'll, you know, I'll go out and I'll, I'll go and see my friend or whatever." It's yeah. not something that you would go and, you know. So I think that's the interesting thing about when legalization happens everywhere just to yeah. be able to see these communities grow and what's your community like then so what's your what's that that community like do you see everyone out in your streets as well and you know what do you know everyone there is, is it big with lots it's, of people yeah it's not very big actually unfortunately but yeah like Are there okay, lots of so, women? no it's not a lot of women <laughs> that is so sad i don't know if it if it's because they send maybe their boyfriends to go and get the weed i don't know so many of these cannabis clubs, they're not super... Okay, I would say that they are not super... I am fine being there, but they are not super female-friendly. In a way, yeah, yeah. they are very bro, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I know what you mean. Yeah, they're extremely exactly stereotypical. <laughs> stereotypes. Do you say stereotypical? <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. Did you say that? Yeah. <laughs> so the reason why I first started laughing is because I'm thinking about exactly exactly the same thing here right so if you yeah. if you do there was a couple of clubs here and you know one of them one of them when i went to yeah it was really really looked really fantastic but, but when you say like, clubs like is it with thc weed as well there were club clubs here and there, there was one club that i used to visit and yeah it was it was closed down unfortunately it was but at the time they had a really good arrangement with the, cool. you know, in the local area and it was kind of like quite tolerated um, but 
Yeah, I mean, it shut down all of these clubs, unfortunately. They have to shut down because we don't have this, the le legislation. But um, it, the actual club was really nice. Mm. You know, the actual inside was fantastic. But it was just, you know, again, you talk about sort of stereotypical. It was just a bit stereotypical. So it's not, it's not anywhere that I can, you know, go and hang out with my female friends. Kind of no, thing. Um, no. And when I saw things like, is it the Lowell Cafe in... in West Hollywood open. Oh, it looks gorgeous. <laughs> I said, oh, it looks so nice. Just looks just like the kind of place that. That's how I'd I like, want hey, to Hey, let's look go. Like. Yeah, I'll see you for lunch. Yeah. And it is, it's kind of strange, isn't it? I mean, when you think about, let's think about how long Amsterdam has been there for. It's been there for ages. Know. It's been there for so long. And that, yet that image, I mean, I love. I love Amsterdam. I love the people and the city, and it's really oh, same, wonderful. Same, yeah. But when you look at that, I do sit there thinking, why do you know? I haven't been back for. When's the last time you went to Amsterdam? It was probably, I haven't been back for a few years. Yeah, for me, it was at least four. Years. Right. Okay. Yeah, I think about the same for me. But I do think to myself now, given the sort of the global industry is growing, mm -hmm. you know, why don't we have those spaces? You know, how come, maybe I'm really hoping those spaces will come, you know, like a, yeah. but even Laurel Cafe, I don't think, I think maybe perhaps it's just, there's a lot of regulation to work through, even with cafes like Laurel, you know, I think even where you are, you know, it, it, you, it's legal, but we women want more, right? I mean, it's kind of like, it would be so amazing to have a place where, I suppose it's, you know, it, and also it depends on the members. I mean, I went, I saw, I went to a, a, an event here, which was a, a, a private women's um, club, like one of the first private, just female. It's not a canvas oh. club. It's called the Albright. Um, and there was an event there, which was, you know, we did an event there, which was awesome. But places like that are coming up, right? Female yeah. member bars. And so I think, I suppose, in the future, it will be hopefully a progression, you know, of that. And then we'll have more spaces like that, which are open yeah. in general and, you know, how yeah. Amsterdam has never really, we've never seen that. And so we've only, no. I've always grown up with an external view of cannabis. That's Amsterdam, you know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because oh, that's, that's the first people. encounter, like, where you can buy it in a store. What you was know? your first, what was your first encounter? I'd love to ask you, actually. <gasps> So the first encounter I mean I was oh la la it was when I lived in Paris <laughs> and uh, yeah so it was because before I mean so in Sweden babe oh my god the, the cannabis climate is very it's very hostile I would say really oh yes definitely oh. I mean you're 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 considered like a hardcore junkie for wanting to sit in and smoke weed and not go out and drink alcohol yeah yeah, we have yeah. a very big, wrong with you, yeah. like, you know, you've got your addicted or whatever. Oh, yeah. Like, you're definitely a bad influence. <laughs> like, I am a bad influence for a lot of people. I mean, probably you too, of course, yeah. in certain... Yeah, um, yeah but, but still, yeah, it's, it's really bad. Yeah, let's talk about that next, actually. The stigma yeah. and the influence. Sorry for interrupting. I hope you enjoy listening so far. Please check out my account Lady Silverstone at patreon.com so I can continue creating cannabis content for you. So I had this view of cannabis and drugs in general, but specifically cannabis for some reason. I'm like, no, this is so bad. It's this gateway drug and everything that I've heard. I mean, I had no clue. I never tried it. <laughs> you were counting when you were younger. Yeah. yeah, but you know when you just hear stuff and you just think it sounds like the good thing to say. Yeah. Did any of your friends smoke or did any, you know, did you know anyone when you were younger who did smoke, you know, weed or? Yeah, so I knew one uh a <laughs> no not even yeah, like a really good person. one <laughs> a oh, really good it. yeah but i got so angry because i just thought that this was going to destroy this person oh. like i was sure of it you know when you're so sure when you're so afraid and that's how that's why i can yeah. so, i can't empathize with the people that are very scared yeah, because yeah, i have true. been there yeah, you know, yeah. I know the feeling. You know, yeah, yeah, you've been through the whole thought process of, of exactly, what you're yeah. worried about. Yeah. But again, then I turned 20, I moved to Paris, I opened up my, you know, worldview a bit, and I started to encounter more and more people that used cannabis, and that was really nice people, had great jobs, had uh, 
family or partners or you know did oh. what everyone else is doing and for me I hadn't really seen that understanding that people everyone yeah it's yeah it's part of a lot of people's lives yeah so the exactly and it's not only is not, yeah. yeah and it's not only young people I mean I saw you know friends parents doing it people that worked in banks or people that were do you see what I mean like so th- it was yeah, a completely yeah. different new group of people that I saw using yeah. cannabis you know and yeah so that was when I got a bit more um I'm like yeah we could try the barrier came down a little <laughs> oh like a lot <laughs> a lot especially being like that age like when I was 20, I still never even tried a cigarette. So I think I tried cannabis. At the same time, I tried tobacco at the same, at the first time. Right. As it so was yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is in uh, Europe. Yeah, I think a lot of people. Exactly. Yeah. Now I c- cannot even think about mixing the cannabis with, with tobacco because, you know, when you yeah. get used to not doing it anymore, like it's so weird that we just automatically do that here in Europe. I think it's also, but it's also a, an access thing in terms of price and, Definitely. you know, what, what you can get. Because you literally, if you, I mean, sometimes when I look at the ones that they roll in America or whatever, I just think, oh my God, that will be like my whole stash gone in one go. One joint, yeah, <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> that be like on the floor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know exactly what you do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, So so who did you try? I mean, who? You know, what? Where were you? And who did? So I stole a bit of hash (laughs) from. (laughs) You you naughty girl. (laughs) But from from uh, from someone that I knew was smoking, but I didn't dare for some reason to like ask for it. You know, so I'm like quietly try. Yeah, you know when you take with the nails. You know, I'm like. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, like yeah. a little piece oh, of hash. <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Put it in my pocket. I know. Yes. <laughs> Did you know what to do with it though? Did you know? No, you that's know, the thing. Do do? So I went home. <laughs> like me and my best friend, we were living together. I'm like, okay, so I have this piece of hash. We need to figure out how to smoke it. <laughs> and yeah. it's weird with weed, right? Because it's already, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. But here, yeah, we had to find ourselves a cigarette. Yeah, and then- oh, yeah. We were like, but give it how to do. Yeah. And it was a bit before. Okay. I wouldn't say that. We like hash. We like, you know, Europeans yeah. love hash. Yeah. yeah. No, so Go true. <laughs> and most of the people used it, actually, at that time. Yes. Or at yeah. that time. But probably now still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did you, how did you know? Because it's not like you had YouTube to like just, you know, That's how to roll a hash. <laughs> no, like that didn't like exist. <laughs> yeah. Now you can find lots of tutorials, I'm sure, but yeah, yeah, yeah. at that time, yeah. no. But um, no, so we managed to, I think we asked a neighbor who was a bit in the same, um, he was the same age as us and we had a pretty good, right. okay. you know. Oh, yeah. Like, hey, so do, do you have a cigarette? So we didn't say why, but we only asked for one cigarette. He's like, yeah, but we can have a smoke together. We're like, no, no, no. We just need to borrow a cigarette, you know? And, and then the papers. What papers did you use? Oh, we opened like very carefully, like an envelope from the bank and used that glue. <laughs> I mean, it's insane. Now, I mean, that joint just fired up uh, you know it took we had it for like two minutes because yeah, it was yeah, yeah. burning so fast <laughs> obviously and i don't know it must probably have been really bad because imagine all that glue from the from the yeah, yeah, paper. Yeah. So, so, so was your first experience a bit like i mean or did you like it i mean the thing is that it was it was more exciting i say yeah I suppose it was so, more yeah. of an adrenaline kick than like a cannabis kick <laughs> yeah a bit like my first kiss more adrenaline yeah yeah okay oh wow but, yes but, but then you had you know but but the whole myth around it had been you know crashed and it wasn't so bad or Completely. it wasn't so yeah 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 oh that's you know I when have... you just break from one day to another you're like ah okay yeah 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 and i think that's the weird i suppose that is the strange thing about any Anything, I think, you know, I, I was watching um, a program about, on Netflix, about avocados and how avocados, uh, I'll tell you why I'm talking about avocados, and how yes. the branding of avocado had developed over the 80s, you know, why we love avocados. 
the avocado was introduced as this amazing fruit. It was like this Californian fruit and just branded and marketed really, really, really well. Mm. In the same way, I would say how bizarrely Coke is, right? So talking about cocaine, right? I mean, when you think about how we've grown up, cocaine was branded as the rich person's drug. It was sort of white person's drug. It was very yeah. kind of like glamorous and sexy and and, you know, when you look at cannabis, it wasn't that. It was kind of like, oh, you know, who, what kind of people to make cannabis? So that, that, that had a really big, I don't, I think when, when I first tried it, I don't, all I could think of was Bob Marley. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is Bob Marley's kind of thing. And, you know, I love Bob Marley. <laughs> Bob Marley's cool, you know. And I just remember my, uh, my first experience was, was with my sister's, boyfriend who had brought some via Barcelona and we had these we were just in this little party and my sister was like no she's not allowed to have anything no, 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 no. ah so it's your and big sister then my big sister was yeah. there and it was at her university we we're in Wales yeah she, had, she was living in this big house and you know it's like I just remember thinking am I going to get to try some this is really cool right so yeah. I was just like <laughs> waiting to try it and I was just watching my sister having this kind of like mini argument with her boyfriend and he's like, oh, for God's sake, you know, she's old enough. And, you know, I think I was like 15, 16 or whatever at the time. So, like, you know, just give her a little bit, whatever. And he kind of explained to her, look, you know, this is really not a big deal compared to alcohol. And I think I remember mm -hmm. him saying, look, he, so you don't mind her getting really, really drunk. Um, but you won't let her do this. And, and so my sister was like, mm -hmm. and then, you know, we had these two. So the peer pressure kind of kicked in a little bit. Yeah. But, you know, also what he said at the time really does actually ring true because alcohol is so much more toxic. And, you know, we forget oh, yeah. that. It's on the top of the list, you know. It's the kit stress and alcohol are two big, big killers. You know, cannabis isn't. So, so we had this hash joint and he was going on about how wonderful this Moroccan hash was so I got the whole backstory of the origins of this hash and I was like yeah this is really cool and he was from Berlin this guy and he was like mm. really cool it's very cool <laughs> Berliner you know like the cool yeah, yeah, yeah. he was this very cool Berliner and yeah I had a really good time there, but I didn't after that I didn't associate it with something that I could get for myself I was too young Mm. I had a nice experience and I remember thinking, oh yeah, you know, and I didn't associate it with anything except for that was my experience then. It's not something that I would normally take. But then I think when I got to university and I had this time on my hands and, you know, I think that's when I started to really enjoy just relaxing. And then since then, I don't think I've ever really seen it as anything but a plant that helps people relax. Yeah. So when other people are really snobby towards it or you know I've always had a set of friends who are not snobby towards it and then I've also got you know lots of friends who just think it's disgusting as well you know yeah, yeah, yeah. and so everyone who thinks it's disgusting is quite happy to do everything else <laughs> do you know what I mean and I think Definitely, that's the yeah. weird thing right it's yeah. such the strangest thing and I think it all goes back to the branding of it, you know, and I suppose maybe I'm from branding and marketing, because so I'm always obsessed with things like that. But it was, you know, when I watched that avocado program, I was like, wow, you know, that's just like hope. And it's just like weed. And, and so the whole kind of rebranding of, you know, cannabis and, and giving it a bit, a different face and persona, which is what I love about your content, you know, and I just wanted to take this moment to <laughs> applaud. <laughs> yeah, so, Thanks, Andy. And think, yeah, and I think, you know, that's why we're doing we're doing what we're doing because yeah. when I saw Amsterdam and then I saw Canada and America, I just thought, no, 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 hold on, guys, they are making it look different. And mm. that was the one of the. I wanted to ask you about um, consumption as well. Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah. You know, um, because when when I was at university, the way that I used to take or, or used to consume was used quite a lot of bombs right but they were like really big bombs yeah so I always talk about one of my first bong experience was this giant triple tube purple monstrosity <laughs> that my <laughs> friend Gary had right and it was just this huge bong it was like literally this big and you had to kind of come down, <laughs> down on it because I think the funnel was at the top and that was my first experience of a bomb. And I remember thinking, 
say I'm at uni, you know, this is the time to try everything. So, but I just remember feeling very conscious because there was probably like four guys in the room and like maybe like one girl. And it was so sort of phallic and, you know, obviously it's like, you know, it's something that, and it just felt a bit, I liked the effect, but I just didn't really enjoy sort of like the giantness of it. And yeah, just sort I of, see. You know, and, and now, you know, one of the things that really made me realize that things have completely changed is when I looked at this brand that um, I really love called Stonedware, which do little like pipes. And oh, I've seen that. Like, and very pretty, right? Yeah, really pretty. Um, it's, it's funny because it's like, I think that was one of the, the biggest aha moments about how the industry had really changed, obviously the inclusion of women, and then the women designing things differently and really changing yeah. the way, and the aesthetic of how things look. And I saw these, they, they were make these pipes called geo pipes, and they don't look like, um, they don't look like pipes at all. They just look these, like these beautiful ceramic pieces. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought, that looks so different to Gary's, three tube purple bong. Alien looking <laughs> bong. <laughs> the one you need to go down on. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's completely different. So I mean, you know, consumption, I love the idea of the, you know, just, just different consumption, but, you know, just opening that whole space up. And yeah. now we're seeing a lot more vape. Um, and I wanted to ask you a question, you know, of all the friends that you, that, that you have, um, you know, do people ask you for things or do people sort of like, like for example, with my friends, I'm mm. really surprised that a lot of people want to try vapes, you know, it's not mm. something that we openly talk about really, or I write about a huge amount, but you know, if I'm going to a dinner party or whatever, it tends to be at the end of it, you know, they will get out like a little mini bomb or a vape or something. So it's kind of, even though people don't really talk about it a huge amount, they yeah. do like it at the end yeah. of the night, you know? And this is the weird thing. It's like, but instead of getting out that monstrosity, you know, I'd rather have this. And yeah. So, and yeah, it's I very easy you. to like bring around as well. And it, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, exactly. And I, I think the idea of smoking, you know, any tobacco, Mm. is is just you know now it's just sort of like the next generation they won't they won't be doing that you know they oh. unfortunately they will be vaping and i think this is the thing that i wanted to sort of discuss as well because vaping is something that i really do enjoy but because i've got two kids it's something that i just don't really go for a huge amount because the minute they see something like that you know they'll be like yeah. ooh. and then i watched <coughs> on netflix they had this I'm always referring to Netflix because I do think they just have amazing content. They yeah. had this really interesting program about, um, which included vaping, and it had this principal of an American high school, and they, a stupid amount of children were vaping. Nobody had ever smoked a cigarette, but they oh, all Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, no one, they were like, ew, cigarettes, but like, oh, do all day long. And, you know, there's memes that are out there, which is like, oh, you know, when I find out dual pods are on promotion or whatever. Whatever. So ah, okay, yes. Thing, yeah, it's something that I have to be, I suppose I'm really conscious about, but there's a part of me that also says, well, when I grew up, cigarettes were around. You know, when mm. I grew up, alcohol was around. Yeah. Um, so I suppose it's just one of those things that you balance, really. And I, yeah, but I wanted to ask you what, what, you know, your friends ask for or what are they interested, what they are interested in within this space, you know. Yeah. Are they like, ooh, do you know a good THC vape or, you know, do you think they're really going for things like cannabis oil? I mean, so what, like, mostly what they've been asking about is, okay, so obviously oil, that is, CBD oil is, everyone is a bit interested in it. Obviously, yeah. it's everywhere, it's very new as well, it's new and legal. So people are like, oh, wow, so that is also cannabis, you know? Yeah. It's a bit, hoo -hoo. Does it get you high? <laughs> exactly, like, unfortunately not. <laughs> But I mean, <laughs> I wish you could have the choice to like get yeah. one to one ratio at least, you know? Yes. That's, that, yeah, that is what I think everyone deserves because I think the biggest issues that I see, I talk about everyday wellness. I, I love mm. talking about CBD in terms of, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a doctor, but you know, I'm a woman, I'm a mum, I have a very, you know, everyone has busy lifestyles. So, yeah. but yeah, I, was, I think that was, when it came to sort of consumption, what surprised me about the market here is when I first got back, a lot of my friends outside of London were, had tried CBD oil. 
and they were okay. some of them were taking it. Yeah. I mean, but in smoke kind of, form or in oil form? In oil form. In okay. oil form. So, but not no THC, just just no. DVD oil. Um, I'm not even sure where they got it from actually, but they they've been trying it. And but these were like mums who were more sort of almost isolated out in the countryside. Okay. And so when they did get together it was really like gather you know small gatherings kind of they didn't like go out a ton and stuff no so my other friends who were very social always going out they didn't they didn't they hadn't heard of uh, cbd they hadn't heard of the you know they weren't really hugely interested to be honest at the beginning oh, okay so, what a difference though i know yeah that's why i was like what and i and i and i sit and i wonder why that was because we don't have any data on usage per geographical area you know mm. i don't think we've got you know i like cbd intel which is the, the the research group i like to get you know to read up on are really great but i don't think i've seen per you know area but that was something that i noticed mm. and, and so a lot of the, the people you know a lot of the friends are asking me for something to sleep so i think sleeping was one of the biggest issues um mm. everyday stress yeah something that I can just not lose my shit at the end of the day. Yes, you know yes. I, mean? I just don't want to lose my shit at the end of the day, like just be this screaming, you know, because a lot of, a lot of mums, you know, it's a long day, especially with very young children. Oh uh, yeah, I can imagine. So, you know, rather than turn to a glass of wine or, you know, whatever you have, then it, it it's a, it's a much sort of, I don't know, I think they were looking for a much more natural sort of option where they could just have a puff and then just, you know, just yeah. relax. So I think that those are the things coming out from this side. Um, but, yeah, now CBD oil is 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 more widely used. Yeah. There's more of an interest in it, but there is still really, low, there's still very little education in terms of what, you know, the, education is coming but it's just you know it not every long knows. time yeah yeah because you have to sort of talk about i mean i wanted to ask you as well when did you when was your aha moment about how cbd works um and like what what are sort of your favorite kind of resources in terms of to explain it to other people so for example I have two things that I like to share with people when they're brand new to the subject. Mm. One of them is a documentary. I'm going to send you the link. So one of them is a documentary uh, called The Scientist. You may have... Um, ah, with... Um, um, Raphael Meshulam. Yes, same. I also... Yeah, yeah, I refer to that one a lot. And I love that one. Right? Yeah. Because I just love... They, they tell the story of how he discovered THC and, and split the plant and yeah. how he researched it and what the climate and environment was like back then, you know, he just used to take Super interesting. Yeah. <laughs> a load, of it. <laughs> load of hash back to his lab. Yeah. Super interesting. So there's that one. And then there's another one, which is by um, a scientist who just explains very simply the endocannabinoid system and homeostasis. So that's, I think those are my two go-to videos and okay yeah you know the only problem is one of them is like 17 minutes long the other one is one hour long so it's very difficult I think people's concentration is bad it's quite I limited. know yeah and also so like that, some people really want to like read an article about it you know to yeah. be able to read themselves and like okay maybe make notes or something other people really want to watch something because they want to just be able to sit down watch yeah. everything have all these you know yeah information coming to them and then maybe rewatch it or then from there say okay what in here was most interesting and then google uh, yeah their own research which is really yeah. that's why i mean the scientist is a really good start to i think it's a really good introdu introduction to yeah cannabis in general it's it's awesome it's beautifully made, it's beautifully made. and he is he's so lovely the he guy, is, yeah, or the scientist. The scientist, yeah, the scientist. Oh, so, cute. so cute. <laughs> <laughs> he's like everyone, you know, a fancy grand. You know, like he would be like such a cute grandfather. Right? Oh, Everybody I know. Yes, <laughs> they call him the, the grandfather of cannabis. cannabis. Right? Yeah, and I think, um, uh, yeah, I would. So I wanted to ask you: Is there anything else that you look at and refer to, or especially when you get asked? Oh, what about this? Or, you know, what about that? Besides your own blog and platform, of course. You know. Yeah. <laughs> is, there, is there any of, like, anywhere else that you like to, 
to read that one because I think sharing where we get our sources from, you know, and inspiration from is probably, I suppose people can, you know, you navigate, right? But I always get asked, well, where do you, like, what should I read and what, what kind of podcasts and what kind of things can I, you know, yeah. look at? Another one that I go to is Civilized. I really enjoy Civilized. Oh, yes. Which okay. is a publication, yeah. There's two I really enjoy. Her, but is that one, that one is American, right? Is Civilized American? <laughs> Canadian, Canadian. It's Canadian, okay. So, yeah. yeah, so I, I think I like going to Civilized just because a lot of the time when I'm looking at things to research and read, it's just not quite the tone I want or not quite the subject matter that I want. And I was really looking for things to read, not, you know, not like super heavy medical stuff. I do like medical stuff, but sometimes you want something which is more about lifestyle, right? And yeah. I think they've got the balance quite right. Uh, when you read Civilized, it's kind of, yeah, it's just a good balance. No, it's true. They have a really good tone in... Um, in yeah, it's yeah. grown up. It's like yeah. a grown up. So you don't feel that it's at all, you know, it's stoner, right? It's like, no. it's, it's, it's just like a because normal lifestyle. Like, yeah, I don't like that too no, much. No, and I really loved um, their cannabis culture polls. I'm really a, a complete sucker for culture polls. So they've got a lot of culture polls there. So, I mean, I'll say, you know, to anyone, please look at the civilized culture polls because they're so interesting and it just talks about... Um, how many parents doing it? How many, you know? And they, they, I think they just really that's great, people. yeah. And is that only yeah. in in uh, Canada or no? Is, they uh, have... Yes, no, it's only in Canada. So I mean, like okay. that's that those culture polls plus Van der Pop's theme with uh, women research is is always quite interesting. I, I love mm. I do love research and I love kind of like obviously it's super, of like, um, yeah. It's so, and so, I mean, what I usually do, so when I, so usually what I do when I write, I decide like a topic and then I just Google my topic and take everything that yeah, I, yeah. yeah. And then I just go back and see like, where are their sources from? And yeah, if yeah. most of them come from, you know, like scientific sources, most like, yeah. the, let's say they have three of the same, three medical papers. Then I read that medical paper And then I understand like where they got there. And sometimes, you know, they can be wrong. They misinterpret maybe an information, you know, so that you also have to be very aware. You, you have, have to, to cross analyze like crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, mean, I think that's another thing that's really important. We've seen a huge importance of, of people having to do that, you know, because his generation, um, they live, they, they have, they cross-reference everything. They have to oh, say that's they amazing. Able, yeah. Everything. Yeah, and we, we're talking about subjects which are so grey in terms of, you know, the difficulty that we have here in England is when people read things, especially doctors and scientists, that you know, they want the evidence from their own shores. You know, oh, they don't yes. necessarily want to see, you know, read and, and take the evidence from Canada or America. It just feels that they need to have their own set of evidence made in their own way yeah exactly so they, they know yeah they know yeah and there isn't much movement on that and that's been a really frustrating thing for everyone here because yeah you know hey, there is evidence and so yeah i think it's interesting to see how everyone's going to be how everyone researches you know and and how we're all going to have to be very very good at research in the future yeah. it's not it's not enough just to pick up a product and buy you really have to check everything about it yeah but it's actually really interesting like once you get yeah, into it. it it's awesome yeah. it's yeah, really nice exactly. yeah, yeah. Exactly. but i was going to ask how is it actually now in because i don't know if i'm wrong but hasn't uk said that they were going to make some kind of trial like a two-year trial of yes they've got the drug science group they have a two-year medical trial um i think it was it's coming out it's called project 2025 i think okay and they've got actually it's not 25 sorry i think it's less than it's two years right so i think it's i can't remember the name maybe it's 2022 but it's basically yeah within two years um it's a set amount of people uh they're They're doing clinical trials as thoroughly within that sort of more shorter space of time than they're used to. Um, yeah, and we should have the results in two years. So that should really be... That's good, though, no? Biggest. Yeah, it is. It is good. I don't, I don't know why I feel so... 
kind of like a bit. Yeah, but maybe it's, it's, it's not great enough news. either. The law. It's great, no, it's great news, but I think it's difficult because you you look at it and you think there's one thing that just made me feel a little bit like I was just a bit disappointed, just the, the lack of inclusion of females. <laughs> So uh, I know they're trying, I know they're really trying hard, you know, and I and I get that it's expensive, um, and it's not a criticism to any anyone, but I think overall just the lack of um, include because it's it's harder to include women into clinical trials for lots why? of different reasons. Oh, because, because of our, like cycles. It's just things like it's just things like you know, if, things like work schedules, you know, commitments. So. Maybe it's, you know, there's lots of times of, you know, women can't get away from the house because they've got too many commitments um, or it's just underfunded, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, but I think those are the main constraints. There's sort of typical sort of, you know, just a, a timing kind of yeah. constraint. It's very difficult to get the woman there and it's more expensive um, because she has to maybe travel from home. She might not have her own, you know, transport. Yeah. She might have to get care, childcare to... In, you know to balance it out and yeah so they don't we don't really get as included as we should it's never really 50 50 which is how it should be oh it and should definitely be that yeah and also because we have a lot of uh, there's a lot of uses for women specifically when it comes yeah to and, and i think this is what i wanted to also sort of talk about the the one thing that really gets me excited when it comes to all of the projects The, one of the most amazing things that I've seen happen in the industry is a piece of research that's happening by a brand called Gynica, and it's spelled G-Y-N-I-C-A, um, and it's the original scientists who were part of the whole Raphael Meshulam's team, um, and oh, wow. they have a laboratory called Lumir Lab, and it's in, it's in Tel Aviv which are doing amazing work, right? So look, Israel, they, yeah. they, they, they did it. That's where he was, um, Rafael Meshinab. So I think they've dedicated a whole study on womb health and how cannabis is affecting <sighs> our wounds, right? Yeah. You know, because it's... And, and I think that is what's so interesting. So, I mean, I think more than that more than the sort of like projects where we're sort of seeing medical cannabis you know i'm really interested in what what this lab is doing because it bugs me that whole women not being included in research yeah. really when i really understood that i just got so angry about it. I just thought, bloody hell you know cannabis can really help our womb health and it can really really help so many things that are really under under research whether yeah. it's like PMS or whether it's hormone management or you know whether it's kind of like us dealing with menopause or whatever oh, um, yes yeah it's just totally underfunded and totally under research so yeah things like that I find really amazing and just the idea of endometriosis and I've met a lot of people a lot of women who are using cannabis to really help with their endometriosis that's whether oh, same yeah 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 right so and, yeah. yeah I mean I just want to talk about that a little bit because It's something that didn't even, I didn't really understand it before I came into this industry because I've had two kids. Um, I hadn't really thought about my womb <laughs> yeah. after I had the two kids because, you know, I, I, womb health isn't something that I really thought a huge amount of um, until I went to this event at the Albright. And actually I went to the event and it, we... The entourage really, event? No, it was, this one was a, an event with Grace's CBD, which is mm. a, one of the first brands british brands to get into selfridges so you know the reason why i think that's a really cool brand like they really yeah uh, chona who's the founder she made a huge she made a huge impact in this in this industry she really like did carve you know like a path for a lot oh, of people. thank god for those yeah i know chona was one this of is hard work people. yeah chona was one of and if, if she ever listens to this hi chona i love you chona <laughs> And I But hope I can have you on the podcast one day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She was one of the, the most amazing females who, you know, really kind of said, yeah, come and, you know, come and learn. So she has a brand called Braces. They have mm -hmm. um, CBD oil, but she focuses on skincare. And I went to this event. Again, it was, it was more of a women's health event, but it was about womb health. And I really didn't even, I've never really thought of those two words together really for, for, for a yeah. long time. But, you know, there was a doctor there and Shona there and she was explaining about endometriosis and how women are really using um, 
can be CBD oil, whether it's kind of consuming through flour or, or everything from using it with balms around your tummy, you know, when you get mm. all those cakes and floats. And just kind of the understanding that there, there is a solution out there for PMS, but potentially there is yeah. a solution out there for all these things that we've always just been told to just put up with. Oh, <laughs> it's like, yeah. I came away from that event thinking, why do we have to put up with so much? That is so crazy. Think about it. Like back in school. Yeah. You remember oh. back in school, like they're like, no, just take a pill and go back. Like, mm. I just want to lie down in fetus position and cry and not listen to anyone like why do i have to be in school like i can't yeah. it's so, crazy I mean, one, one thing that i'm so thankful to cannabis for is just really opening up my mind to this whole area and just understanding that you know it touches this area when i was younger at school um and i came on my period i remember <laughs> i was such a, a, a geek i'm a proper brand i did my like first brand review i, I applied i wrote off to tampon companies and you know you get all those samples and stuff yes. so I, before my period i had all of these different sort of like tampons no way like, i know what a, i'm just like thinking god that's crazy. so anyway back then you just don't get told a lot of the things that you should kids should be told you know they right now there's a huge amount of deficit of education especially for young girls um and I just think brands like Braces and, and there's a few others, you know, who are really going to change the future for, for yeah. women. And what we have to put up with um, is, is pretty amazing. So I'm looking forward to all of that, you know, in the next few years. Yeah. And the, what's the name? Is it Ginko Gin, or Ginico? Uh, Gynico. So it's Gynico. G-Y, yeah, G-Y. Like, like gynecological, but like a sort of friendly name. Guy, G, guy, G-Y. <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah 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 i think i, they, they, I think you already sent me that their profile and the, it's they do, yeah, they that do i found it yeah yeah they do suppositories so when will um, they actually so they are doing a lot of studies now or a lot of research yeah. now i'm not too sure when the research is coming when it's coming out um it's it, again it won't i don't think it's too long but it it's interesting because it's probably one of the, the world's only research which is just dedicated to that particular area. So exciting. And it's, you know, when we think about the endocannabinoid system and, and think about how it could be, you know, could we as women live without pain? Is it possible? Exactly. <laughs> is, really? it like, is that the future? You know, is for, for yeah. us not to have any of these symptoms that we normally wouldn't? Yeah, it must be, right? Because, you know, when you think about birth, now we have epidurals, now we have all these different things. So in the future, yeah, I, I would say it's possible. You know, we will, we will have a world when we don't have to do everything else and be in pain at the same time. Yeah, you know? because we're already, I think, okay, I might sound sexist, but I think women can do so much at the same time i'm not saying that my husband is uh, dealing with things badly no not at all but when he has a migraine i mean babe you know it's like a full day off in a black room for me i can have migraine fever hardcore pms i'm like what do i have to do I'm now you know? <laughs> yes <laughs> what's next yeah, <laughs> which is which is i think is something that we have been forced to do since we are kids because in school I mean, we get, I got my period at 12 and I have endometriosis, which I had had for pain since I was really, really young. So, so you have that since, so endometriosis, did it for you, did it come on like on your first period? I, or, that's the thing. I don't, I don't know. Do you, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, that's the thing with endometriosis. It's really hard syndrome. So, is it a syndrome yeah, or yeah. is it a disease? Uh, no, I'm just saying. You get symptoms. I mean, you have symptoms of. And I, I'm not yeah. a doctor. I'm not too sure what they yeah, say. Yeah, same. You know. It's a yeah. more <laughs> disease. Um, no, so it was. My period was really bad from the start. Like that. That's for sure. It was really bad, and I remember going to. Sorry, this is a really hard word. Gynecologist. I think it's a really yes. hard word in English. Gynecologist. Oh, it is one of the worst words. Yes. Say, yeah. yeah, and. Um, and actually, she said that, oh, no, but you can, you can avoid this by taking the pill. I mean, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So I was on the pill for 10 years. 
which is a really long time. Like I started my pill at like 14, maybe even 13, which I think is very young. Yeah, as a as a means to a way to alleviate the symptoms yeah. of endometriosis. Yeah. yeah, that's how I started the pill. It wasn't because I was sexually active. It was because of my my really bad period pains. And, right. But you know, at that time, you don't care. You're like, really? Can I get rid of this pain? Amazing, yeah. you know. Yeah. So yeah. I was on that for ten years. Four of like the first four years, I had no period. I mean, can you imagine? That was amazing. No period whatsoever. But then it came back and it was, it was fine. But I started to get, you know, when you're like, shit, am I eating something every day for 10 years? Like, what is this? It's something that's yeah, stopping yeah. Like, my period. Yeah. Like, that, that cannot like, be good. <laughs> what, is, yeah. what else is yeah, what Wait a minute. Is, what, yeah. is, what is the... Is there any consequence to this or is there any kind of like... Um, exactly. What's the other side of this? Yeah. Yeah. So it was a 2014 that I stopped uh, in the end of 2014. And it was in the same time where... You, know, you remember at that time, a lot of people started to say like, no, it's not, it's not very good to, to take the pills for that long. And people started to get very conscious about... There were all sorts of things going right. Yeah, all sorts of theories of what would happen or what you... Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I and I think... That made me like, I had this switch at around, because I was 24 at that time. And I had this switch. I'm like, ooh, yeah, true. What, what am I like putting in my body? You know, when you just have that switch one day, when you start to realize that you're actually putting things in your body yeah. and that freaks you out, you know? Oh. And then you're actually also, it comes out of your body into sort of like a system, you know? Yeah. And I think about all the women, yeah, we're all kind of like putting things into the system as well. Yeah. And that has such an impact on our uh, cycle, which yeah. is also, yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's a bit scary. So when I stopped, that's when hell broke loose. <laughs> and that's when like the really hard pain came back and it got worse and worse from 2014, I would say. Already I have very bad menstrual pain. Like it's, it's really unbearable already but now it was a little bit everywhere in my cycle so it could be when yeah. i had my what do you call it ovulation for example yeah. yeah so in the middle of the the cycle i could feel these stabs that just made me drop to the floor out of pain like my legs couldn't like hold me up you cannot even take like one step with the foot because like that motion will just make everything yeah i mean you just want to like switch the lamp off and like yeah. don't feel yeah. anything anymore did that make you think, God, I've got to go back on the pill? I have to, you know, what, what did you do? I think it crossed my mind maybe once or twice, but not more than that. I was more thinking like, okay, should I make this operation that people are doing? Which is, you know, I don't know, you have to go in on like by the belly button and then on the sides of your uh, ovaries, go in right. with like a small keyhole operation. But again, a lot of people get their endometriosis back a few years or even a few months after. I don't know if I want to make an operation to take these scars away and then maybe have it back in a few years. I don't yeah. know if it's worth it. I was I told, yeah. I was told, um, I met a few women who, who had been told by their doctors, well, you either get pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> just like, I'm 18, I'm not going to get pregnant. Or exactly. you have a hysterectomy, you know. Oh, and, and, like, are those the only two <laughs> options? That's horrible. <laughs> I was told, you know, I was like, wait, 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 what is it? What, what? And this, yeah. this was a number of women who, who you know, who, who said this. And I'm just like, is that really happening? But it is. Yeah. And, it's crazy to think that these are the only options and that, you know, it, it will be, I really hope that in the future we're going oh. to be using it more. Oh, babe, I really fine. think we will. I think we will. I think girls, when they start to have their period, I think they will seriously have a lot of help from cannabis. Yeah, I think it will be, anyway. yeah, I think it will be like common practice for mothers to maybe... Yeah, either give CBD oil, that you have a CBD oil even with you to school and you take that in the morning, you take it yeah. one time during the day and maybe in the evening. Like, it will be normal. I hope. Yeah, and it won't be... And it's funny because just as you said that, because we said that we, we would touch on stigma and stuff. Um, yes. I, I, when I came back, you know, I was going back to... I was putting my sons back into a new... Well, it, was, it wasn't a new school, it was our old school. And... Mm. I remember one of the mums 
I had sent something round about CBD and I think one of the mums came back to me and said, oh, this is cannabis, you know, this is a gateway drug kind of thing. And I just, you know, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it wasn't, I mean, at the time I just remember thinking, but, oh, I hope she's not going to call anyone. Yeah. <laughs> like, I really hope she's not going to, like, call ahead and say, oh, she's doing this. So I think I was a little bit worried about, oh, God, you know, sort of even speaking about CBD, say with new mummy friends or you know things like yeah. that that you, you do have to be quite careful because you know people really because of the lack of understanding people could misdrew it as something else you know and but the fact is you know the lines do in america the lines are blurred anywhere between medicinal or recreational but even when i'm talking about just cbd it is quite difficult um but yeah after a while i found that i had mums coming up to me and saying I give my son CBD oil for his ADHD, you know. Oh, or really? I give my, yeah, I give my daughter CBD oil because she's a little bit down and she's really anxious, you know, at the moment or whatever. So slowly. That's amazing you know, that they feel that they can come is, to you as well and know, talk about it. Yeah, and we do talk about it. And then they talk about their dosage and they talk about how much they're giving and how they've had to, how they haven't had anyone to talk to and how they mm. haven't been able to do and this is something you know again this is something that ultimately you can get in holland and barrett now you know but yeah. the, the stigma around it is still high and it's still sort of i think that's changing i think this, that will it's changing a lot right but for some reason i think around the whole mums and obviously kids you know cbd oil and kids is is and i wanted to mention you know one of the saddest things that's happened through um, obviously, this this time with with you know this terrible time is um, I don't know if you know, but you know Charlotte's Web, the brand yeah. Charlotte's Web, lost Charlotte Fiji, which is the daughter um, of the family who were really inspired by cannabis. Oil. They found that it worked for their daughter, and you know, unfortunately, it's so sad that she, oh, she yeah. recently passed away. How old around. was she? I think she was only she was under the age of twelve. I can't. I think she was around ten years old, um, and I just thought. It's amazing. I really, I really hope that, you know, Charlotte's name goes on in everything that we all oh, do. Oh, it will. It will. Again, that's a brand that I just wanted to say, you know, I absolutely have so much of admiration for because one, it was a patient-led brand, CBD brand. That's, they, they say it's the world's most trusted brand. And I think, yeah, it is actually. What's the name of it? Charlotte's Web. Okay, so and the Charlotte brand is called Charlotte's Web. I yeah, it's it's Charlotte's ah. Web. When I, when I first saw it, so the, you know, as we're talking about different brands, that really made me think, "Wow, that's you know, completely changed." Charlotte's Web. They started some story. I'll just really quickly. The story was little Charlotte. Um, she had a form of epilepsy, which was very you know, difficult. I think it's uh, it's just a, quite a rare form of epilepsy. They found that cannabis all worked, and the family, Paige uh, Fiji, she met a, another family which had seven brothers who were all hemp farmers and <laughs> amazing like so their mom grew you know she raised seven sons who then became hemp farmers so <laughs> yeah. wow, that's really cool so together they came up with a formula specifically for charlotte that really worked and i think it was the reason was because they couldn't travel all those to go and you know to source all these different kind of uh the medicine for her so they made it and they made a blend which was just right for Charlotte, very high in CBD. And yeah, it worked. And, and from there, because it was specifically made for a child, I think the amount of work or impact it's had on the world to say that, look, this is safe, this is yeah. you know, trusted, and it's not going to get you completely high. This is something that a kid can take, you know, that just really just did so much for the industry. So yeah, especially you know, when you have kids and they have to take medicine with so many side effects. Yeah. And I think yeah. this is something that, that, that I, I suppose, you know, being a mom, like, you know, it's one of the main reasons why I kind of feel passionate about this and why it's kind of a calling for both of, for, for everyone. Right. It's yeah. like, you're helping, you know, it's, it, this plant can help vulnerable people, it can help so many different ones, but, you know, most importantly, what Raphael Meshulam said, the originator of, of discovering, you know, THC, was that one of the biggest benefactors of oil is going to be kids. And it's funny because it's, it's the last thing we're allowed to talk about. And I just thought, oh, I'm yes. talk about now because you know what? It's the last thing that people talk about, you know, with, with pets and children. 
we're not allowed to do anything with pets and children right now. And, and yeah. I've been, and, you know, it's weird because you, you, the stories that have moved me like probably the most are the stories of how kids, kids' lives have been transformed, whether it's Callie's son or whether it's um, Charlotte yeah. or whether it's my friend who's giving it to, you know, there's their kids for ADHD. So that's something that I think in the future I really want to see open up a little bit more and, yeah. and have the smell come down because mothers need help. Kids need help. And yeah. the, the original reason, the, one of the biggest benefactors of this plant is children. I've got friends who, you know, have been offered the most craziest drugs for their ch- children's epilepsy or fits, you know. And these are drugs that are made for adults. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're drugs yeah. that are so toxic. Um, and yet the, the parent is forced into a situation where they don't, feel they have another choice um mm. they're not offered another choice and that that is something that has to change in the future you know yeah cannabis as much as we are you know society is still scared of it there's so many aspects and so many people it's whose lives it's completely transformed and you know that's kind of kids kids can't carry on taking uh medicine that was designed for adults we can't no. do that no you know so we've got to be able to give them something else. That's, I think, one of the biggest areas that I hope changes in the future. Yeah. The stigma around, you know, being able to treat the child or the stigma around mothers who are choosing that route and having yeah. to go abroad, being forced abroad, spending tons of money just to get their kid access. That's got to change as well. It's right? got to change. And I think, I think your children's generation, like when they are around their 30s. And I think the world is going to look very different in yeah. terms of cannabis. Don't you think? Like, because yeah, 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 you're yeah. up with a complete different... It's going to be, oh, yeah, cannabis. Do you have any, just, do you have any friends? I'm aware that we've been on for a while, but do you have any friends who are like third generation um, uh, cannabis consumers? So, for example, I've got one friend who is... Well, one friend, as, as in uh, somebody who was living in London, whose grand, you know, she used to smoke with her grandmother. And I think that's like so cool when you get people who... Yes. Oh, yeah, it's really I don't cool know thing. anyone. Yeah. I've got, I've got, sorry, I've got two friends. My other friend, who's, who's a guy, he's, he's from Amsterdam and he used to, yeah, he smokes with his parents. And again, that's something that seeing cannabis, but best buyers doing yes. a video when she tries cannabis with her dad. It's yes. so adorable because she's really shy around. And so I think I really enjoy the multi-generational aspect yeah. of how we learn. And I mean, um, you're, you're probably going to be there soon, you know, sit and smoke with your <laughs> sons, you know? <laughs> it is, but at the same time, they're, they're young. So I think as much as I speak to them, it, you know, for example, yesterday we were cooking, we were cooking pasta sauce and I was using hemp oil. And mm. it's not CBD oil, just hemp oil. But I was just sort of talking to them about the difference between, say, olive oil and the hemp oil. You know, mm. it, hemp oil is a bit more nutritious. It's got more sort of omega-3s. So I tried to talk to them just in a very kind of matter-of-fact way about yeah. things. Versus, you know, but at the same time, I've got, you know, I do talk about legality. You know, mm. what is what is the idea of le- legality? And it's really bizarre when you try and explain it to a child that this plant here, you can be put in prison for it, but here it's fine. You know, it must be so like, oh, it is confusing. Weird. Yeah. I really hope, I mean, they do get it. Um, they do also understand even the word cannabis is a contentious word. And so okay. it does become something that I say, well, look, you know, don't, don't talk about it like yeah. <laughs> all the time. Then. But, you know, the eldest came back and said, oh, you know, mummy, in this chart that we were looking at at school, they were looking at sustainable products and one of them was hemp. So, yeah, I do think in the future it will just be fine, you know, but we yeah. keep it we keep it quite private, you know, in the house in terms of what I sort of talk to them about. And, ah, really quick, I also wanted to ask you about growing because we are trying to grow some hemp plants. Yeah, the one and, you seeded a few weeks ago. Yeah. It got squashed by a football. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, too bad. Bring back uh-huh. the Why did I put it there? Why did I Had it already it got a bit big? It was kind of like, it was looking really cute and really nice. Oh, like, you know, yeah. 
I want to do things more in, in more bulk. Um, but yeah, now they're older, I think I, I'm just going to be growing some industrial hemp, you know, just to yeah. sort of really show them the actual journey of it and really get them to understand it. Really just like for everyone, for all of us yeah. to understand it a bit more. I mean, it's a um, plan. Yeah. It's a, yeah. Um, I don't know if I've got enough because cannabis you have to be very dedicated to even when you you know when you grow it right yeah you can't just go off for a holiday for two weeks no, or anything like that no <laughs> it's a no, baby it's like a cat it is yeah like it's there it, it, it survives by itself but you still need to give it food Dear listeners, if you like what you hear, please check out my Patreon. The link is in the description here below. Only if you're able to, of course. Now, let's get back to our guest. I wanted to ask you, uh, what kind of strains do you like, particularly for your own, you know, for your own uses? Um, I'm really interested in the whole idea of strains for women mm-hmm. and what, what kind of strains women like. Uh, obviously a, a better blend of CBD to THC um, ratio. Yeah. And maybe something that's not called Alaskan Thunderfuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Alaskan Thunderfuck. <laughs> I think that's one of my favourite, like, shock names for cannabis. There's so many different ones, right? But, like, Purple Monkey Balls or something like that. I can't remember. Oh, my but, gosh, you know, yes. I think, I think uh, I think one of the strains I was looking at Leafly the other day, and one of the strains that they said that you know a lot of their re- uh, reviewers really like is Blue Dream. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that that's sounds so lovely. Is it, that sounds is it really good? nice. It sounds so nice. Yes, so I think it's really interesting. Yeah, no, I yeah. actually use one that is called and. Like now, I barely smoke only THC. So you know the stuff that you yeah. buy at the cannabis social clubs. It's too hard for me because since I would say a little bit more than half a year, I've been mixing. So first I started by just mixing that weed with CBD flowers. So I had, let's say, 50-50, for example, or like 75% CBD and 25% THC yeah. and I mix this together which is really really nice like that changed my whole way of consumption in a way now so what I'm smoking what I'm vaping is a strain called sweeteners so how cute oh, oh yes I think I read that on your blog yeah that's so I just sat there thinking wow sweeteners oh, that's one to like, one ratio that's it's so awesome. nice. is that something you purchased from the social club uh, no, unfortunately, because in the social club still, what I would say 99% of the people wants, they still want the high THC weed. Yeah. Which yeah. is unfortunate because I right. actually think it's, it is nicer with a bit less, like mm. way better high even. Yeah. I feel it lasts longer and also you get this like really nice body feel without getting you know this cloudy sometimes yeah. when you take you can get a little bit dizzy i wouldn't say dizzy but you know this cloudy. little bit yeah <laughs> cloudy perfect cloudy <laughs> with your super yeah. beautiful british accent cloudy <laughs> but you know i think i suppose it depends that, and that's why you know we need we need to have a wide range because yeah. You know, in an illegal market, you just get, I mean, you do get a lot of different ones. And I, I understand that, you know, there's delivery services and all sorts of stuff and menu, people have menus and everything, but it's still not, um, I, I would really like to see, you know, a regulated market. So there's yeah. a choice. There's just more education really as well. Mm. Um, because here it's just, I don't know, I suppose we have a fear of weed here being very, very strong. People yeah. say, oh, the weed here is so strong. But actually, I think in, in when you look at the, the, you know, when you do get a chance to look at the ratio and you understand the ratio, then it's not any stronger than a lot of the stuff they have in America. So there's no. a big... There's a real big fear here, you know, of THC and, and what it does and what it could. But I think that's the understanding that, say, people, we're, up, we're really beginning to understand that it's not just about one type of cannabis. It's not just all THC that just no. gets you, like, puts you on the ceiling. Because it's not like that at all. So I think that's, that's one of the biggest things that I really want to see, the ability for people to see that it's, as you yeah. get your daytime weeds, you can still do all of your things, you can still function, exactly. and stuff. Some people 
have a little smoke, and they go off and do a ton of stuff, you know, very productive. Or oh, well. yeah. It's very, <laughs> very totally. fun for two hours. Yeah. That's something that we really need to, yeah, to, to see more of, the understanding that there's lots of different types of exactly and we need to yeah. we need to yeah get our hands on it get access to that because now yeah i mean maybe maybe your perfect ratio is something completely different from what you're smoking now actually you know and you can yeah. get you can benefit so much by i don't know maybe for some people it would be slightly more thc with still much more cbd inside who knows maybe because they really need like the super medicinal effects for their really bad back pain yeah 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 so there's there's so many ways that yeah which is and we will see it we will see it and i'm so excited for that time but it will take so time. what are you looking forward to when we when we open up again you mean from lockdown yeah so i live three minutes from the beach so oh. i just go and like torture myself when i'm out with my dog just listening <laughs> to the waves i'm like oh yes <laughs> And you're Please. not allowed to sit on the beach right now. No, so they closed off the beaches everywhere oh, in Spain. Yeah. Ah, because they saw that like as soon as they closed the, the bars and stuff, everyone flocked to the beach and had picnics. So they were like, okay, so this doesn't really work. Yeah, a beach is really tempting. I just yeah. wanted actually to ask you a very quick about Canascope. Oh, yes. Canascope, I've always wanted to have my own, like my own agency. Um, and I think it's really kind of like the culmination of all my experience. It's when I came back and I looked at branding and marketing, I felt there was a, a gap in the market for more of a specialist, um, more of a specialist shop that kind of really understands CBD brands because a lot of the time the clients when they want to be able to talk to uh, marketers they don't ne necessarily have to you know they don't want to really explain everything again so it's quite nice when they speak to people who have that um, skill you know branding yeah. marketing but they don't have to literally repeat themselves all the time so it really was to sort of fill a gap in the market um, and I Branding and marketing is something that is just part of my DNA now. I've been doing it for so long, but I'm really passionate about the idea of um, rebranding the whole industry into something which is more inclusive. And I think, mm. you know, when I looked at sort of advertising agencies here and around the world, um, there needs to be more specialisms, I think. You know, I think mm. ultimately I've worked at a very traditional advertising agency and the future of agencies, you know, was something that really kind of was always on my mind. What is, what is the future sort of agency model going to look like? Um, and I think obviously it's very digital, um, but it is more, it is about niching, it is about understanding and it is about sort of creating communications that haven't been made yet, you know, yeah. whether it's for women, towards women and towards female consumers. And the thing is, you need people who are very passionate about those subjects in order to kind of crack those briefs. Yeah. Um, if, if their passion's not really there, you, the work doesn't come out as, 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 as well as it could do, you know? Mm. So I think that's, that's where my passion really was. So I started, uh, and you know, again, I'm, this is a startup. So we're, I'm literally sort of like right in the middle of it. Um, and I think that the other thing that I feel really strongly about is just the idea of impact investment and understanding that in the future, all businesses, we are going to have to have business models, which do include the whole triangle of people, planet, prosperity. Yes. But when, as we go about our business strategies, how do we make sure that that actually happens? How do we make sure that we include things? Or how do brands um, really look at the work, the work that they're doing already and understand, actually, yeah, we are doing great things in these different areas, but we mm. don't really know how to talk about it. So I've, I've come across quite a few brands who are doing amazing work, but they find it a bit, difficult to communicate that yeah. so with my background I've done quite a lot of work um, in development as well and so that's why I'm really passionate about sustainability and also kind of like different development projects which don't just 
include people in this country but people across the world as well mm. and I think yeah there's going to be it's the, the future has much more of a the future has brands have a big role in the future you know in yeah. terms of they really really do need to have a, a look at these areas and really understand how everything that we do is going to have an impact um yeah. so just really raising consciousness not just in the consumer but in the brands as well is, oh, is something yeah. that I've really important you know is really important so they have a huge role yeah yeah and I think when I in my last role I did a lot of work with the UN sustainable uh, sustainable development goals mm -hmm. um you know we have a set of goals that the whole planet the whole world really needs to help try and achieve and I'm very interested and I'm very fascinated with how brands fit into that so Canoscope really is about how brands will be well will be looking at themselves and the world and how how they can create impact through mm -hmm. different projects um which kind of come under those sustainability goals so it could be about the de development of women you know it could be about sort of like looking at consumption and responsible mm -hmm. consumption and safety around that um there's about i think there's lots of different sustainable there's about 18 different goals but ultimately cannabis and the in cannabis industry can really contribute to a lot of those goals mm -hmm. so i think i'm on a mission i'm on a real mission to kind of see how that is going to pan out and to understand how we can really make sustainability happen through cannabis yeah so one of the things that i do is that i help um advise a company in out in myanmar and it's a young team of people who are looking at industrial hemp as a way to really bring sustainability to rural um, farming in, mm. in Myanmar. One of my biggest dreams <laughs> I'd like, is to actually have a female sort of led farm, you know, um, it's, it's kind of a very, obviously a very long term dream, but I think in Myanmar the idea in Myanmar, I mean, like, yeah. it's a really long, we're, we're talking about a really long term dream because, you know, this is, there's a lot of... Uh, then you have a long, good time to prepare. <laughs> I have a good time to prepare yeah. that. Um, but, you know, the idea of really empowering female farmers, and the reason why I say female is because in, in particular in Myanmar, um, a lot of the husbands, uh, mm. they migrate. And they go, you know, especially in the rural areas, they, they go and find work in Thailand or, you know, and, and they oh. leave, they leave their farms and they leave, you know, that they leave a lot of their families very vulnerable. So really finding a way to, to really empower a very large sort of population, mm. which a lot of the farms are run by women, you know, they're, cause they're the ones who are left there. But, but again, you know, they're, they're very vulnerable. So in Burma, I mean, I had, I've worked with one project, which was a microfinance project and, um, a female farm collective. And these female farmers had literally pulled together all their resources and the bank that I was working for, we did microfinance loan. And I just remember asking them to come, come to a press conference in in Yungo and they came to the press conference because we we taught it that the, the project was with action aid which was a very big NGO out there and they talked about the project and I mean I was just literally blown away by how they presented the whole story and everything that the project had impacted and you know I think the press conference was kind of the culmination of a lot of work mm. but you know that at that moment when I sat in that room I just thought wow this is amazing and, and really the whole world should be really working for, for to get people like yourselves to be yeah. really enlisted yeah. empowered so it's not something that um you know, it's a short-term goal, it's a long-term goal, but I really believe that industrial hemp and, and hemp cultivation can really, really help communities, developing communities. So I think, you know, when I think about Canoscope, um, all of those, all of those projects um, would be coming under, you know, coming under Canoscope and, and, and what the values of the company is. And yeah, just really understanding Exciting. how... Yeah. Yeah, how we can how we can align better with the the sustainable development goals and how mm. cannabis can fit and our, our industry can fit into that. There is one research study that I'm going to send you. Um, mm. It is called Cannabis and Sustainability, and it's yeah, done by a, yeah a group. And what they do is they look through every single sustainable development goal and they 
they look at how cannabis can help that goal, achieve that goal. Now, not every single sustainable development goal is, you know, it matches with the cannabis industry, but it does match with, say, I say 60% of those goals. So they're mm. the ones that I'm focusing on. And they're the ones that I'm, I'm really now looking at how, how this industry and, and how sustainable development goals can can match and how we can make it happen and it's something that's kind of new and it's <laughs> sustainability is not something that I know it's funny because it's 10 years ago um, most people who were working within sustainability roles had to do it voluntarily it wasn't something that was of importance to com- companies and, and to be honest you know I went to a sustainability summit about three years ago and found out that the biggest threat to business is you know, climate change and, and the things that come out of, of, of it. Um, mm. But it was like number 20 on the list of what they, <laughs> you know, what uh, they actually yeah. want to deal yeah. with. So then we realized, you know, obviously there's this massive disconnect between urgency and, you know, an action. And, mm. and I think that has you know, changed a lot though now, right? Now it must be on the right? top five uh, priority, I think, for many companies, right. no? It's something that companies or, you know, they're, they're aware, everyone's aware of it now, right? I mean, we're just coming mm. out of this pandemic. And, I, and I'm really, I, I think that, you know, now after all of this, you know, passes, and I really hope that we find a, a great cure for it, after all of that, it's going to, you know, the world's not going to be the same. And I think mm. we are going to be looking at everything in a longer, you know, more sustainable lens. And I yeah. think we, we need to. And it, it's not really going to be a choice for companies to ignore that anymore. You know, we have to find a strategy. And so in order to do that, we do need people who are thinking about that area, you know? Mm. So I think that's why I really want feel really um, compelled to do it. And obviously, you know, I've got kids and we've, they, you know, want to have a good future. So it's really understanding how businesses can work and become a lot more aligned to goals that are shared with the whole world and not yep. just specific to their country and specific to their one company group. or yeah yeah and also mm. highlighting you know i'm also going to be highlighting the companies that do are doing good already oh that's you know? nice and, yeah because people want to know who they can who they can yeah, trust taking, I mean, yeah. We, we need re- we need real examples so you know there are things like at the moment there are lots of initiatives around sort of eco packaging with cannabis goods and recycling with cannabis goods yeah. and things like that so you know yeah i'm really fascinated in those areas and i and it's something again it's a passion project you know i do i'd love to make a business out of it but i'm going to be starting it as a passion project and you know ultimately they're we've got people who are really passionate about the same things that I am. Um, and I'm building, that's a very small team. Uh, but again, it's going to be, it's going to, I've got a long term goal on that, you know, yeah. and that really. But that's good. Sust- <laughs> that's also sustainable. As it's well. sustainable. <laughs> yeah. In itself. Yeah, really sustainable. <laughs> but you know, again, it's, it, the funny thing about cannabis is that everything's that, you know, the goalposts change so quickly and, yeah. you know, regulation and, and, and just the difference in all the different countries. So part of the, part of its role will be to, to do what we do. And, and that is to educate and to really kind of dispel myths. But yeah. then the other part of it is really to open up the dialogue around cannabis and sustainability and really kind of shed a light to, to other you know on other countries as well you know some Mm. of the work that we're doing and about to do in Myanmar is really really interesting you know I've got you know the company that I'm advising for they've just found a a a local community in Putao which is northern Burma where near the Himalayas Mm -hmm. and this sizable community have been doing have been planting hemp for centuries and they've got they've got a whole cottage industry that no one's really noticed. <laughs> it's oh, kind wow. of like, okay, they've been clothing themselves. They've been making oil. So, you know, uh, there's so much going on. Um, and that's been done on a very sort of tribal level, you know? Mm, so the, uh, yeah. the understanding around kind of strange genetics, what is the best genetics for a country that is, is developing, you know, that has a fantastic climate, but yeah you know, and, and a very farm agricultural heavy um, sort of influence. But, you know, how do you get the right strain to grow in that particular environment? How is it managed? How do you empower the, that farming community? 
and how do you look at things like land rights you know so these are all things oh, that yeah. we have to learn which is really really you know really really tough and so I think the challenge with Myanmar is probably one of the biggest challenges of all because ultimately it could be it could end up as one of the the you know, it could end up as a really great blueprint for sustainability, but mm. I understand a lot of harm can be done as well if we don't get the process right. Yeah. Um, so it's really about using my skill and expertise to try and apply it to some really super sensitive areas that really do need that kind of ex sort of understanding behind it and really the empathy and the compassion yeah. because... One of the other things that are difficult with a country like Myanmar is that it's very vulnerable. Um, we're right next door to China. <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> you know, yes. And, and a lot of the issues that we have... And it's a very are, small country, right? No, it's actually quite Isn't big. It? It's, it's France. I know. I think it's because of the way maps are drawn these days. Yeah. You know, I think it looks like drawn. it's a very tiny... But okay, it's next to China. Yeah. So it's the size, so it looks the size of France. It's the size of France and Germany put together. So it's big. It's like a no big... Way. I know! I mean, it's also I mean Asia is just huge Asia is huge Asia yeah. is huge yeah and I think this is that the whole cannabis market in Asia is yet to kind of explode I mean Asians and cannabis is so heavily stigmatized it's probably you oh, know when yeah. you talk about Sweden it's yeah it's exactly the same only criminals smoke cannabis really mm. you know like in, in, and and yeah. but the funny thing is it's called the word for cannabis is seichout in Myanmar, which means sitchout. So it means dried medicine. Mm. So it already has, yeah, it already has a very different, um, you know, a different kind of take in terms of the actual name means medicine, you know, it yeah. really does. So it's, yeah, it's something that, that needs to be worked through. We've got a terrible case, you know, um, where the first medical sort of, hemp research or well, medical it was medical cannabis it was kind of like hey it was, it was cbd mm. but the first research plant that opened there recently there was a huge misunderstanding and there's been some you know imprisonments um Oof. and this is something that happened over the within the last year literally um some misunderstanding between like a different regional kind of states um permits were not given on a regional basis they were only given on a local basis and therefore there was this huge misunderstanding which unfortunately got the locals into prison you know oh. so we we've still got there's two people who are still in prison he's just received his sentence it's 20 years no. and that's 20 yeah 20, 20 years for just being part of a research project on CBD. Um, wow. Cannabis. So, I mean, cannabis, that's, that's being produced for CBD or So, yeah. It's, wow, that's uh, really we bad. Have, we have to go right, 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 right back to the beginning. Yeah. And yeah. I think, but one thing that I'm really hopeful for, and I'm really, really hoping this is going to work, is we do have a really amazing national champion. And, you know, you and I were talking about how you break stigmas and, and who helps break those stigmas. Yeah. And one of the things that is really interesting about Myanmar is that we've got this huge uh, MMA champion. I think mm -hmm. it was like, you know, mm -hmm. like a mixed martial arts champion. And he takes hemp oil for his recovery. But he lives <sighs> in America. Yeah. So, I think I mean, I've read about him. Yeah, he's yeah. he's called the Burmese Python. <laughs> That's his nickname. Is the it's Burmese like a stray name. <laughs> it is like that. Yeah, God, it's like a stray. We've got Burmese Kush. We should have Burmese Python as well. Yes, <laughs> but he he's the brand ambassador for a CBD company um, called Love CBD. Mm -hmm. Sorry, not Love CBD. Love Hemp. So, love Hemp. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, Love Hemp, which is a really established British brand actually. So, you know, the idea of potentially using sort of, um, you, you know, using, you know, recruiting people to really help the whole nation understand is, is something that is really exciting. And I really hope, you know, things like more initiatives like that happen um, yeah. and, and come to fruition. But yeah, with, when it comes to sort of demolishing stigmas, sometimes it can be done overnight with just one person, you know, yeah, and that's so what the interesting thing, right? Is it's, yeah. yeah, I mean, and, and each person has a different celebrity in their mind who will alleviate that concern for them. Yeah. So a friend of mine, for example, her mother was really against cannabis oil. Um, 
But then when they found, when she found out, oh, Olivia, Olivia Newton John takes it, yeah. she was okay. With it. Really? So I think it's really, yes. yeah. So, yeah. And, isn't it like, yeah. is it because yeah. she's Sandy from Greece? Exactly. <laughs> and, <laughs> is it because you're so used to her and you know, but so I think it's, I think my mission is just to really understand how to unlock that and to mm. really um, understand cultures and really what is going to alleviate those worries for, for not just this culture, but for my culture back at home, which yeah. is a completely different culture and really understand what, um, yeah, what the government really need to, to really ed- get educated. Mm. Um, because again, you know, a lot of, a lot of companies who approach people, they don't necessarily approach them with the idea that they're going to educate this group no. before, no. before doing business, you know? So I think a lot of the time that, that, that happens, it's a real shame because you're missing a huge, you know, we've already got a deficit of um, education. So the people who really need to be educated are the, the people at the top as well. You know, we need yeah, education yeah. for everyone. And, Things are not going to change and laws are not going to change until we get that understanding. And right now, you know, we do have people in, incarcerated all over the world, you know. So yeah, yeah. that's that's why there is a sense of urgency to all of it this. It is, a, yeah, know? definitely. And that's why we need to get it done because, you know, it's so ridiculous. And one of the stories, you know, the, the, I mentioned 20 years for that gentleman. Um, there was another person involved in the case and she was the intern on the case. And mm. so they had a medical research plant. I think about five people were employed. She was just an intern, a 21 year old intern whose mom had said, Oh, you know, the me daughter, there's a, there's a job that's coming up and it's really near to our home. So, you know, the idea of this mother being in absolute agony, thinking oh. she just recommended her daughter to go and work on this plant. Oh, I don't really know. It's just like a medical plant. And then her daughter got put in prison too. So oh, her daughter was in prison. No, and, and, and we're talking about prisons which are really not funded. Let's put it that way. No. Uh, they don't even provide the food. So oh, you, you have to have buy your to, own food. Yeah. yeah. So it means that her mother would have to then travel to the jail every day with food, get past the guards, get past the police. So she may be asked, you know, for bribes or whatever, but it's just not easy. It's really, really tough. And it's, it's yeah. kind of tougher beyond, beyond our imagination, actually. But yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's people like that that I really want to help as well so as much as I do it's weird I've got I've got, you're rocking so, oh, I'm saying you. No, but I've got sort of like the, the projects in Burma are really different to the projects that I do here they're so different um yeah but yeah it's needed on every single scale and on every every kind of level so yeah I yeah, think yeah. that's why all of us are like there's no time to waste anymore you know we need to no, get this done. definitely yeah. I want to say thank you to people like yourself as well because you know ultimately we need we need people to help fight this fight and and we need people with skills we need people who understand how to change aesthetics you know what what that entails um and we need people to sort of really be passionate about about the plant and show everybody else their passion it's not easy sometimes also to blog you know for me for example because i'm an asian woman i'd love to say a lot more than i do sometimes you know but yeah, yeah. it's it's quite tricky and it's quite, well, I don't know whether it's risky, but I think I do. When you get people saying, aren't you worried about social services? <laughs> you do think, oh, okay. Well, like, can should I? I or <laughs> why? Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, all of these things, you know, this, that happens to me on a very small scale. And, you know, when you think about the, the women who have had to go through social services over ca- a real related cannabis problem. Um, but yeah, I just, I just think that, you know, it's a, it's a real, well, it's kind of an, I, I hope that this is probably the most important thing. Well, this is the most important thing that I think I can achieve in my oh, life yeah. besides, besides my family. Um, yeah, of course, just, but that is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of a given, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. Outside of that, outside yeah. of that, I'm not number one. Yeah, I really hope that, you know, de- I'm dedicating my whole career to this now and in, and it's because I really, really believe in it. So, yeah, yeah I just hope that, oh, that we get closer rough. to yeah. regulation. And yeah, I really hope that one day I will, I hope, I hope for the day that I can call you up and say, he's out of prison or, you know, yes. <laughs> oh, really, really wow. and, yeah. And I hope and, I won't yeah, be 50 at that time. I hope that before his 20 years is over, it's 
something is going to happen yeah, over there. Yeah, already. But I mean, that. Thailand is already opening up a bit for the, so who knows? Maybe they have, and and yeah. I think the Thai. I mean, I remember the Thai making a comment about you know like the project that we have here, which I think I can't wait for the results. Um, but when you look at Thailand. You know, they opened up um, within, I think, one year of planting to producing the oil. They already had their first test of 500 patients in a government hospital. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So their approach is very different. It wasn't so rigid. And, you know, with because it's a plant, I do think, wow, we we do need some flexibility here. You know, Mm. we can't test everything in the same way that we did before with all of our pharmaceuticals. It just doesn't even work. It's a a different kind of thing. So yeah, I'm really, I am encouraged by countries like Thailand. I do, I know that they have their own issues politically. I get that. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. On the whole, it's a really warm country that have a really, they are very compassionate people. I think Mm. they can be very compassionate ties. So yeah, I'm really, really sort of psyched to see how this develops in all the different countries as well. Yeah, Yeah. It's going to be so different, but it's going to be very interesting to see. Yeah, it is. But they run away now. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I need to go. So thank you so much. It was awesome to talk to you, babe. It was fantastic. And I think you've also got a lovely voice. You've got a really good voice for podcasts. Oh, I think <laughs> you really have, though. Either. You really do as well. <laughs> we need to, I think I need to do some sort of podcasting. But yeah, I'm going to probably... That would be super soon. interesting. And I really hope that, yeah, I can chat to you as well on, on it. Yes, yes, yes. And I mean, I want to invite you again. I mean, we should definitely have this again. It's really yeah, yeah. fun. What are you, so what are you doing that today? What are you going to get up to this afternoon? Ooh, well, I got to work. <laughs> I'm going to oh, edit okay. podcasts and I'm yeah. working. So I'm going to launch my website like at the same time. Oh, good, 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 good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's good. But you know, it's a lot of like sitting in front of the computer, having my vape, having my, yeah. you know, yeah. But I suppose this is the time. I mean, we're both going to be doing that, sitting there, squirreling away, working yeah. away. Yeah. yeah. But it's oh, nice. Well, it's it nice like- to have this time. Yeah, it is. And I wonder how much, how long, how much longer we were going to have, but, um, it's going to be a little bit longer for yeah. sure. Here they said a month more. Yeah, I think I least. think we should be at least that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, we'll stay oh, safe. Yeah, I hope Great I see you one day soon as well. I know. Definitely. Awesome. We will definitely, definitely see each other very soon. Yeah, have an <laughs> awesome day and weekend, babe. Thank you so much. Oh, Take lots care. of love. love Bye, babe. You. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. Please subscribe to my social channels and rate this podcast. And if you would like to support me a little bit extra, it would really mean the world to me. So check out my Patreon profile that I linked in the episode description. It's all thanks to your support that I can continue talking, writing, recording and making more cannabis content for you and our amazing community. Have an awesome day and lots of love.